So we'll pretty much always use the the maximum likelihood estimation method that we just talked about for the logit model, but you might run into a few situations where you want to do something a little different. We'll talk about talk about those situations and how to handle them in this video. So one thing I want to point out, this will actually be relevant uh, next week, but I wanted to just kind of lay down the marker here, is that uh, we can actually represent our, our maximum likelihood estimator first order conditions in a slightly different way and get ourselves to a slightly different uh, or, or a very different estimation method. And so if we're, if we're making the logit assumption and if we assume that representative utility is linear, then it turns out that those logit maximum likelihood estimator first order conditions, that the derivative of the log likelihood with respect to theta equals zero, those conditions are equivalent to this mathematical expression here. The math for this is in the trained textbook. So take a look at that if you're curious how we got here, or you could try to work it out yourselves if, you're, if you want, a, want kind of a, a fun exercise to work through. What this is saying, let's take a look at it here. Inside the bracket here, we've got y, our outcome, minus choice probability. y is like what we actually observe, and choice probability is, is like what our model is predicting us to observe. And so the thing in the bracket here, we could think of as like our residual, our econometric residual, the difference between what we actually observe and what our model gives us. And then here we've just got data. And so what this is saying is, is it's basically saying that in our sample of data, our residuals and our data are orthogonal to one another. That kind of, um, th th this is kind of like a sample orthogonality condition. This is like analogous to the OLS regression, finding parameters that make the residuals orthogonal to the data. We can do exactly the same thing here. It's just that kind of this piece, our choice probabilities are gonna take a way different form in a logit model than they do in an OLS regression. And so this is kind of another condition that we could use to find our parameters. Instead of trying to maximize the log likelihood function, we could find the parameters that make this expression true. Well, it turns out that expressions that look like these are things that we're going to call sample moment conditions. And we're going to be able to use GMM, the generalized method of moments, to estimate models based on sample moment conditions. And we're going to talk about that next week. But I just wanted to point out that we could estimate this, this model using slightly different first order conditions uh, with an entirely different estimation method. And we'll look at how to do that next week. The reason that I want to tee up the idea of GMM to estimate a logit model is to think about using instruments to, to, to fix endogeneity. And so the previous slides all required that the data describing the choice setting, the, the X's, that those are exogenous. We didn't really say this explicitly, but that's always kind of implicit in anything we're talking about, that in order to get consistent parameters that are interpreted in the way that we want, those, the data must be exogenous. Uh, and, and if the data are endogenous, then our coefficients may be consistent and really will be consistent. We just don't know how inconsistent they are. And this intuition is exactly the same as endogeneity in an OLS regression that you might be more familiar with. It turns out, though, that even if our data are endogenous, if we have some exogenous instruments that generate variation in our data, and they are really exogenous instruments, then we can use a kind of instrumental variables method to estimate consistent parameters. And we're gonna basically uh, just, just slightly adjust those sample moment conditions from the last slide to use our exogenous instruments instead of our endogenous data. And then we're gonna be able to estimate consistent parameters using instruments and by using the GMM method. So we're gonna talk about that a lot more next week also but I just wanted to tee that up while we're talking about logit estimation. You might run into a setting where there are a couple different kinds of, of uh, w w estimation that you might wanna do still using maximum likelihood though. Um, 
And one of those settings is that it, sometimes it might just be computationally infeasible to consider the full choice set for every decision maker. There's just too many choices. If there are thousands of choices, uh, thousands of alternatives for each decision maker, you just can't consider them all. And you might just want to consider it a, a subset of the alternatives for each decision maker. In some sense, just take a random sample of all alternatives available to a decision maker maybe 10, maybe 50 out of the thousand that I just that I just described, whatever becomes computationally feasible. Well, it turns out if we sample the alternatives in such a way that each alternative has an equal probability of being considered, so you're kind of taking equal probabilities when you take this random sampling, then we can just use the standard maximum likelihood methods that we just talked about in, in the last video. Uh, we, can, we can get consistent estimates. The maximum likelihood estimator is gonna be consistent in that case. It won't actually be efficient because we're essentially throwing information away uh, when, we, when we consider only a subset of alternatives, but it will be consistent. So if you have enough data, um, you're st you should still be fine estimating consistent, consistent parameters uh, with you know, rel rel relatively uh, large statistical power. Of course, there might be some settings where you want to sample with unequal probabilities. Uh, for example, there might be some alternatives that just have very low uptake. If there are some alternatives with like 0.001%, you know, like one, one person in your data set chose that, then there's really going to be very little information contained in, in that one alternative. Like it's just going to be the choice probability will just be so close to zero for everyone that there's basically nothing there to help inform your model. And so you might want to give those kinds of alternatives relatively low weights when you sample, and you might want to give other alternatives relatively high weights when you sample. And you can do that. Uh, you can still get consistent estimates. It's just that you need to make a small adjustment to your estimation procedure in that case. And you can take a look at the train textbook to see the details of how to do this. I don't want to go into the details here. I just want to point you to the right place to find it if you ever encounter this situation yourself. And then the last, uh, the last of our kind of different methods here is going to be if we have choice-based sampling of decision makers. And the idea here is that, uh, or, or, you know, let's think back to what we did in the previous video. We we're kind of assuming once again implicitly that all of the sampling of decision makers is random or at least exogenous to the kind of choices that they're making. But if the sampling of decision makers is endogenous, then your coefficients may be inconsistent. Let's think about an example here. What if you're trying to take a survey of people's commute choices but you take that survey at the bus stop. You can guarantee that you're gonna get a biased sample of data if you're only sampling bus riders about their commute choices. So in these kind of cases, we might actually want to, uh, you know, we're, we're, there might be cases where we actually want to do that, where we want to have uh, kind of choice-based sampling where we oversample some choices and undersample some choices, never to the extreme of that example I just gave with the bus stop, but there might be some cases where we just want more, uh, more observations for some alternatives than others. Maybe a really important alternative to our research question just has low uptake. Maybe we're thinking about how people choose electric vehicles. Well, electric vehicles are still a relatively low market share. And so if we just took a random sample of all, uh, of all car consumers, we're gonna get a pretty low uh, kind of sampling of electric vehicle purchasers. So we might wanna oversample EV purchasers and kind of downweight kind of more traditional cars in our sampling. We can still recover consistent estimates from, from these kinds of, of uh, kind of weighted sampling based on choices. It's just that the estimation procedure becomes more complex, as you might imagine. And it's really going to depend on your specific sampling method that you're using in these cases. So I don't want to go into the details on this either, but I will point you to the train textbook where there's more information on this and references to where you can see some of the different uh, kind of estimation procedures that you can use depending on exactly what your setting is that you're using here for your choice-based sampling. So that's all that I have for logit estimation this week. In class, we're going to work through an example in R where we estimate the logit model ourselves. So that'll be a, a, a fun, fun place where finally the rubber meets the road and we're putting all these pieces together uh, to estimate a structural econometric model ourselves.